Our scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 24th chapter, beginning in the 36th verse. But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away, so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and he would not have let, it, let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The word of God for God's people today. Thanks be to God. So do you know about Christmas creep? Now this is not the Christmas creep. Um, that's the guy at the office who always double dips the chips um, and re-gifts the truck stop fruitcake. Uh, that's the Christmas creep. This is uh, the Christmas creep as in uh, how retailers uh, keep uh, introducing Christmas merchandise and Christmas decorations earlier and earlier. Now, we all know that the day after Thanksgiving is supposed to be the start of the Christmas season, right? But back in the 80s, the, the term Christmas creep began to be used by retailers to talk about backing up the start of the season, it was in the 80s that they started moving from Thanksgiving a little bit earlier. And, and then the, the demarcation became the day after Halloween. But of course, now we've gone back. We saw Christmas decorations before the 1st of October. I am quite sure this year I saw a display that had July the 4th, Uncle Sam and Santa Claus both, both together. They have creeped back further and further. And the same thing's true about the sales, right? The day used to be Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. It was the day, Black Friday. And then they started staying open on Thursday night and then all day on Thursday. And, and, and now I, I saw at least a half a dozen ads that advertised Black Friday prices two weeks ago. Christmas creep at work. If, if, it meant, if it meant that we got ready early and that everything was calm and there was no chaos in the season because we started earlier, then, then I might could agree that that would be a good thing. But I don't think starting early um, gets rid of the chaos for most of us. I really think that we've gotten so used to the pace and to all of the things that, that we try to squeeze more and more into the season and we start early and that doesn't make it easier. It just makes the marathon a little bit longer. Some people have gotten to where they just dread the season. And that's a shame because when we're little, it's a season of such great anticipation we couldn't wait uh, for the Christmas decorations to come out, to eat Christmas cookies, to open presents. Christmas Eve, you remember struggling to go to sleep with anticipation and, and wondering the next morning just what is too early to wake up the parents. The anticipation, the excitement was like adrenaline coursing through our bodies. But, but as we grow older, we lose some of that wonder and along the way, our anticipation gets trampled under the weight of responsibilities and the rush of preparations, Christmas creep at work. But there is a way to fight the Christmas creep. There is a remedy. Uh, it is a time-tested remedy for lost wonder and trampled anticipation. There is a time-tested, Christ-centered, historical, church-based way of fighting Christmas creep. And that remedy is, it's not to buy more expensive presents. It's not to have fleshier decorations. It's not to upgrade the guest list at our party. The remedy is to pause 
to take an Advent pause. The remedy is to step back enough to realize what we have lost and then go on a journey of recovery. That's Advent. Advent, it's like a husband and wife who take a long vacation together so they can fall in love again. That's what Advent is meant to be. An opportunity to see what's right there before our eyes, but to see it with fresh eyes. Advent. We look back. We look back with wonder at the birth of Jesus over 2,000 years ago, while at the very same time looking forward with joy to his return at the end of human history. The purpose of Advent is is to recover that anticipation and wonder so that we both taste the longing of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel and the joy of joy to the world. The Lord is come. Advent puts us right in the middle of those two lyrics in that in-between moment. We look back and, and we look forward. Matthew seems more concerned not with Christmas, but with this apocalyptic day that's coming in the future, a day that will change everything. Advent is about waiting in that middle. Advent really is about remembering not only who we are, but when we are. That we are the people in the middle between his first appearing and his return. Advent is about waiting in the middle. Now that's not easy for lots of us. Watching and waiting are not things we necessarily enjoy. Henry Nouwen wrote these words about waiting. Waiting is not a very popular attitude. Waiting is not something people think about with great sympathy. In fact, most people consider waiting a waste of time. For many people, waiting is that awful desert between where they are and where they want to go. And people don't like that place. They want to get out of it by doing something. And in our time, I think it's it's particularly difficult to wait because a lot of people are fearful. People are afraid of their innermost feelings. They're afraid of other people. They're fearful about the future. And fearful people have a hard time waiting. Because when we're afraid, we want to get away from where we are. And, and well, we're just here. And if we can't flee, then often what we do is fight. Many of our destructive acts come from the fear that we carry. And so we do destructive. We're hostile. We make poor choices living out that fear. The more afraid we are, the harder it is to wait. And that's why we tend to distract ourselves. You look at somebody waiting. What's the first thing? The moment we realize we've got to wait for a moment, out comes the phone and we amuse or distract ourselves scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or whatever, Twitter. We don't want to just be. We want something to occupy our mind. And Jesus said in the days of Noah that because they were not paying attention, at least not paying attention to the right things, the people were caught off guard by the flood. They weren't prepared. He says, oh, they were focused on eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, and they had no awareness of God's impending acts, and so they weren't ready. What was missing was their awareness they, they acted as if life as they knew it would go on forever without interruption. And in that climate, Noah was the anomaly. A non-sailor, he, he nevertheless built a boat 450 feet long, miles from the sea without a cloud in the sky. His blueprint and pattern were faith, trust in God. He was awake to hear God's voice and God's direction, so he was prepared, unlike the rest, as Jesus said. Jesus also gives the example of the homeowner. If you knew somebody was coming to break into your house, you'd stay up. You'd be ready when they came with flashlight on the bedside table, ready at the first little noise. If you didn't know, then 
You might sleep soundly and miss it. That's the tension that Jesus calls you and I, the church, to maintain, to be ready, to be awake. The thing we are required to do is to keep our eyes peeled. In verse 36, Jesus said, Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son know that day when this will occur. It's remarkable How many teachers and preachers seem to believe that they can accomplish what even the Son of God confesses that he cannot? So they predict times and they try to read signs, but but it's not about when he will come. This is just a simple reminder that he will come. It is a certainty. So the call is to stay awake, not work on the calendar. The passage reminds me, That we don't have to know everything. The very fact that Jesus and the angels don't know the answer to the question of when he will return sure does take the stress off us, doesn't it? It should be a relief that we're not expected to know everything. We're not expected to know everything, but we are expected to do some things. Jesus says, be awake. Be prepared. The other thing... I think it's important to remember from this passage is this this story, this season, this apocalyptic vision of the future should bring anticipation but not fear. A theology of the coming kingdom is most faithful to the biblical witness when it reminds us that the Christ who comes as judge is also the Christ who endured judgment for us. God's judgment does not contradict or override God's grace. And that is important. Because a lot of people use the vision of the future to generate fear. Jesus calls us not to be shaped by fear, but rather to be marked and shaped by gratitude. To know that just as he came, he will come back. And on that we can be certain and grateful. The invitation is to be prepared, not to be afraid. Therefore, you must be ready. How do we stay ready? Well, I I think we pay attention. I think the call is to make sure we are focused on the right things. Am I awake to remember the generation of Noah and to make sure that I'm not distracted, that I don't miss it? Advent is a time to beat back the Christmas creep. And focus on what matters. To be ready. And we want to suggest in this season. That the way to do that is to pause. The way to restore anticipation and wonder. The way to push back the creep of Christmas. Is to pause and take time. I want to suggest three, three things quickly to you. The first is to make use of one of the Advent books. I just picked one up as an example from the back. But there are five back there. Grace gave a great description of each of them uh, on the cover of the vine. So I know you have read all read that and know about all of those. Um, and uh, in case somebody missed it, you can read the back of the book jacket to make a decision. Or I can just tell you they're all good. Just grab one at random from the back. They're all designed for a, a page. And they're small books, so it'll be a small page. But a page of thought to take a pause every day for the whole church to pause and spend a little time in a devotional thought to help us prepare heart, mind, and soul for the birth of Jesus. The books are in the back. There are some downstairs in the CLC lobby as well. And and these resources can help us fight the rush ahead By pausing every day with a devotional thought. The second invitation is to a second pause every day. Don't do them at the same time. But one time stop and read the devotional. It'll take a few minutes. Think. And then sometime later in the day or earlier the next morning, depending on your rhythm, stop and read one chapter from Luke's Gospel. And see, if you start today on the 1st of December and you read a chapter of Luke every day, you will finish the book on Christmas Eve. 
And so when we gather to celebrate, when we gather to acknowledge the birth and with the coming of Christmas, we will be freshly reminded of exactly what it is we are celebrating because we will have paused for a few minutes throughout the Advent season for devotion and for a chapter of Luke to be reminded daily. Two pauses. If you think, well, I'm going to forget it. Well, maybe use those smart devices that rule our lives. You know, you can set a timer. You can say, Alexa, remind me every day at 10 o'clock to read Luke. And she'll set an alarm and she will let you know. Uh, Those electronic devices are the thing that the third thing I would ask that we that we pause for a devotional thought that we pause for a chapter from Luke and then that we consider um, blocking out a space of time once a week to not be connected to disconnect you see I think that the devices that connect us to the world and bring the world to our fingertips have a way of connecting us to everybody except those that we are most immediately present with You can see, I know it never happens at your table, but if you go out to dinner, look around and you will see it. Dad is on the phone, maybe continuing work or or working on a practice schedule for the Little League team. And mom is on her phone texting friends about carpool or maybe something from the office. And and the children both are on their iPads and, and they are connected to the world except for the four people who are at that table. It does us good. To think about being off the grid a little bit. On vacation, I I managed to turn off the email and the phones and not look at social media for a period of time. And and to not, except once a day, check voicemail to see if there was an emergency that needed my attention. To not try to keep up with the news or church happenings or social media. And to be honest, I have to tell you, it was great. I got to spend more uninterrupted time with family, read more books, found more real rest. And the greatest thing about it is, you know, we can say we're not going to work when we look at our phone. But if you read what the subject of the email is, if it just catches your eye, if you're like me, you're immediately back at work. You're thinking about it. So you're not really where you are. You're back there. So I would encourage you. To block off some time. Maybe you don't think you can do a whole day once a week. But but that's what I would encourage. At At least a morning, if not a whole day. To disconnect from all of the other noise. So that you can reconnect to with those around you. With yourself and with God. Because when we push back the noise... We can hear God's voice so much more clearly. If it's not a habit of yours yet, I I encourage you to try making disconnecting a regular occurrence. One day a week. To fight the Christmas creep. To make the most of this opportunity as a community. Let's, Let's pause. A daily time for devotion. A couple of minutes to read a chapter of the good news according to Luke and and a day a week to unplug uh, so that we can plug into God and God's word and God's presence to disconnect from the busy to deepen our connection with God and increase our ability to hear God's voice amid the many events the parties and the great fun of this season may we God's people pause to remember Not only who we are, but when we are. And may God add his blessing to the keeping of a holy advent. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.